if yeah. they're not going to get back together. Yeah. Maybe it'll happen. Uh,
Declaration, George Washington, number one. <laughs>
hear the words of our Creator spoken through the prophet Isaiah. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I give men in exchange for you, and people in exchange for your life. So be at peace in Jesus. We are redeemed, we're transformed, forgiven, and made new. Thanks be to God. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Spirit came down, 
that they heard the voice of God. And what God the Father said, this is my son, Jesus. I am well pleased with him. So when we're baptized, what we hear in our spirits and in our hearts is the words of the Father saying, this is my special child. I am well pleased with you. <clears throat> so let's pray. We thank you, Father, that you give us new beginnings. Help us in this month of January to start and make the most of new beginnings. Not through our own strength and power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
And then the Gospel of Luke, Luke 3, 15 to 17, and 21 to 22. And these are on pages 1126 and 1594 in the Q Bible. Let us listen to the Word of God. <coughs> but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your city. <coughs> Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange <coughs> for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And now the Gospel of Luke. Starting with verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. And John answered them, Paul, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Skipping okay, 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And skipping to 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. This is God's word to us today. Well, today we also have the opportunity to offer our gifts in recognition that we're baptized people transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let us hope nothing back, but share our lives, our hearts, our energies, our efforts, and our time in ministry to the world around us.
we humbly pray, O oh God. Let them give you honor and glory as we serve the needs of your people. And let the called and redeemed of God say, Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> The anointing, call and claim. Let's pray first. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son. We thank you for the example that he gives us of how we are to live. And we thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to anoint him. That same Holy Spirit that comes upon each of us in our own baptism and walk. So Lord, we pray that by the power of your Spirit today, that you will open our eyes to see the truth. To see who you are and who we are. That we may see. That you would open our ears to hear your voice that resounds that you were well pleased with us. And Lord, we pray that you would touch our hearts, that you would make them tender and fertile soil for the planting of your word, that, that your word would take root and produce good fruit, that it indeed would bring forth honor and glory to your name. And Lord, I pray that the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips will be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just as I said in the children's sermon that this is the beginning of a new year. And we all tend to focus on and reflect what happened in 2018 and make resolutions for 2019 that it's going to be a better year. We look with anticipation, believing that the best is yet to come. So how are y'all doing with your New Year's resolutions? Well, statistics do tell us though that by March, most people are consumed with guilt because they fail to keep their New Year's resolutions and a guilt that tends to stay until next January when we make resolutions again. But you know, God, throughout his word, tells us that he is making all things new. So, what are the promises that God makes to us about newness in this new year? Well, I'll, I'll quote a few scriptures and let you look them up. In Psalm 42, 8, God says, I'll give you a new song in your heart. In Isaiah 42, 62, 65, and 66, he promises he will give us new things. He will give us a new name. And eventually we'll have a new heavens and a new earth. In Jeremiah 31, 31 and in Lamentations 3, 22, he promises a new covenant and new mercies every day. In the New Testament, in Peter 1, 3, he promises a new birth. In Romans 6, 23, a new life. In Ephesians 4, 24, and Colossians 3, 10, he promises a new self. In Ephesians 4, 23, a new attitude. In John 13, 34, God says, I give you a new in Hebrews 10, 20, he says, a new and living way. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, 
you are a new creation. And then once again, in 2 Peter and in Revelations 21, he promises a new heaven and a new earth. And so with this kind of anticipation of newness, and that the best is yet to come, on this first Sunday after Epiphany, we turn to the scriptures to uncover or reveal who this God is that promises all this newness in our lives and who we are. Now, I wanted to remind you that last week we talked about Epiphany and that Epiphany is from the Greek word meaning to uncover or reveal. And so the second Sunday after Epiphany, our scriptures uncover and reveal who God is and who we are. And when we read Psalm 29, it really begins by proclaiming that there is only one before all of creation, for all the forces of nature and all the deities should bow to, and that is the Lord. <clears throat> that the Lord has such control over all things, of nature, over all beings, that we are called to acknowledge his glory and strength and worship him. <coughs> Now, it's interesting in Psalm 29, where is it that we find this Lord? Well, it says we find this majestic king enthroned over the flood. We find him enthroned forever. So what is it, if he's seated on the throne, what is it that displays his glory and his power and his strength. Well, it's the voice of the Lord. Now, the psalmist uses this illustration seven times in Psalm 29 to point out that the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, is more than just sound waves. And as one commentator says, that words have such substance that they're able to change the reality into which they enter in. You see, in Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is able to enter into a reality and change it. It says the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful and majestic. It breaks the cedars. It makes the country of Lebanon leap like a calf. It makes Mount Hermon, or Syrian, skip like a young wild ox. That the voice of the Lord is like flashes of lightning or flames. And that the voice of the Lord shakes the desert like an earthquake in the wilderness in the bush. That it will even strip the oaks bare and strip the forest. And that the power and glory of God is so evident that those who have come to worship him in the temple cry glory. For us to fall on our knees and cry glory. You see, in Psalm 29, it shows us that the voice of God is able to enter into reality and in doing so is able to radically change that reality. It says the Lord gives strength to his people and gives his people peace. That he marks a new reality because of his voice and his presence. So as we transition to Isaiah 43, we hear the prophet being a prophet. Now, the word prophet comes from a Greek word meaning mouth 
or a spokesperson for God. And as the spokesperson for God, the Lord uses this prophet's voice to be his voice. I am the Lord who created you, who formed you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Now, again, this word redeemer, we don't always understand it. It's from a Hebrew word, goel, G-O-E-L. And it primarily means an avenger of the blood. In Old Testament times, it was the person who would pay off another man's debts and free him from prison. Or it was the close relative that would marry a widow to protect her, like we see in Ruth. And when this word is used of God, it means God is an avenger and a liberator of his people. And in particular, when we hear this term being used about Jesus, it is Jesus as the one who delivers us and frees us from sin and pays the ransom for our sin. But the voice of God in Isaiah 43 continues as he says, I have called you by name. I've summoned you. You are mine. I want us to let that sink in today. I have called you by name. Is what God says to you. You see, it is the voice of God being spoken into our reality for us to understand the new reality that he brings us. For me, you know, having grown up in a very strong Catholic family, during which time the, the worship was such that when I was a child, the, the mass was still in Latin, and that you still had to fast for three hours before you could take communion. And since I went to a parochial school and we had mass every day, my mother packed me a boiled egg and cinnamon toast breakfast for me. And the idea of a God who was so personal that he would call me by name was so foreign to me. I, I couldn't even conceive of it. But in my early 20s, a friend gave me a, a, an album. And it had music on it from the Episcopal Church in Houston. It had songs on it like, Ferris, Lord Jesus. My Jesus, I love thee. And a song from Isaiah 43 that says, I have called you by name, and you are mine. I listen to this record over and over again every day, and just let the words of the, those songs just wash over me as his truth washed over me. That God knows my name. That God knows your name. That He calls us by our names. And then He claims us as we respond to that call. That we are called and claimed by God <coughs> as we journey into this new reality. Now, in Isaiah 43, there's other promises that are ushered and spoken to us. When you go through the waters, I will be with you. Now, the people of God knew about deep waters. They knew about the flood. They knew about the challenge of the Red Sea as the people of God fled from the Israelites. And God said, I will be with you when you pass 
through the waters when you pass through the rivers. They will not sweep over you or overwhelm you. And then when it comes to fire, you will not be burned. Now, we all like the idea of Daniel's companions in the fire being protected by the fourth person in there and how they were saved in the midst of the fire. We just don't like the idea of us being in a fire to test if it works for us. <coughs> but, you know, as we look at each of these circumstances, what we see is the only way is through. Now we tend to, whenever we have any type of flood or fire, we want to go around, we want to go over, we want to go under. But God says, I will be with you as you go through. And I don't know what fires or floods or rivers that you're facing right now. But I do know that we have a God who has called you by name, who has claimed you as his, and he says, I will be with you as you go through. And why? Why would he do this? Well, he says, I've paid the ransom for you. You see, he not only calls you and me and claims us, but he pays the ransom for us. Because he says, you know what? You're precious and you're honored in my sight. I love you. So I want you to say to the person next to you or behind you, you are precious. And on the other side of you, you are lost. You are lost. You see, this God that has called us <coughs> precious, honored, and loved, it says he also cares about our children. Once again, just like last Sunday, we hear promises concerning our children, and I believe that includes our children, our grandchildren, our great-grands, and even our spiritual children. I'll bring them from the east and west, from the north and the south, and all who are called by my name, whom I created for my glory, all that I formed, <coughs> All that are called and claimed are mine. So, I believe our word from God today is get ready for the harvest. Get ready to see the sons and daughters coming in. So as we transition to our last text for today, we see the people with the anticipation of newness as well. And they asked John the baptizer, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that was promised? It's interesting, John answers their question by talking about baptism. John's baptism and the baptism that is to come. And John says, now I'm baptizing you with water. John, um, knows that this baptism, and we know it's a symbol of a cleansing. A cleansing that was a response to the call to repent, to turn away from sin and turn towards God. But John says there's a new baptism coming. One that is turning from sin, one that is a cleansing, but one that includes being immersed with the Holy Spirit and fire. The Messiah will be more powerful than I. Again, the message translation says the main character in this drama to which I am a mere stagehand 
will ignite the kingdom life a fire the holy spirit within you changing you from the inside out he's born the clean house he'll make a clean sweep of your lives and he'll put everything true in its proper place before God and everything false he'll put out with the trash to be burned. You see, John's baptism was for forgiveness and the beginning of a new life. But the baptism that Jesus was bringing is not just about being changed and, and fulfilling resolutions. It's about being called by God, responding to that call, and letting God claim you as a son and daughter, a child, and then becoming a new creature, a new creation in Jesus. The old man, the old woman, the old child dies, and the new begins. By the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit and His fire, we are new. We're called, we're claimed, we are new. And we call this <coughs> regeneration. The old sin nature dies, and we have a new nature in Jesus. Now, just in case we don't understand this, Jesus himself is <coughs> an example of baptism. He was baptized too. Now, we do know that Jesus never committed any sin, so that is the big difference. But as Jesus went under the water, symbolizing the death of our old nature, and coming up out of the water, and as he's praying his own post-baptism prayer, the heavens open suddenly, and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, comes down upon him. The anointing of the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus as he begins his ministry. And we hear the voice of the Lord. And all those around could hear, You are my son, whom I love. You are beloved. You are chosen and marked by my love. With you, I am well pleased. You are the pride of my life. Well, this is the Sunday that each year we mark the baptism of Jesus. But it's also a time for us to celebrate our own baptisms. You see, because I believe that every time a baptism occurs, <coughs> that something similar happens of God's voice thundering. This one is mine. Don't you see my image in her? Don't you see my image in him? And then here comes the Holy Spirit. Not just dwelling upon us, but dwelling in us. To empower us. To sustain us to guide us, to put that fire in our bones as we go about what God has called us to do on this earth. Now, Fred Craddock is a celebrated preacher. And in one of his books, The Craddock Stories, he tells of an evening when he and his wife were eating dinner at a little restaurant in the Smoky Mountains and when a, an elderly gentleman came up and sat at their table and introduced himself and they began the conversation. And hearing that Fred Craddock was a preacher, he introduced himself and just said, you know, I'm 
from these parts. And my mother, when I grew up, she was not married. And there was shame in the community directed towards her that was also directed at me. And whenever I went to town, people would look at me and people would start guessing. I wonder who his daddy is. At the school, he ate alone. In his early teens, he began attending church, but he was always the first out the door because he was afraid somebody would ask him about his parents. Well, one Sunday, before he could escape, he felt a hand on his shoulder, and it was the minister. He looked closely at my face, and I knew he was trying to figure out whose child I was. And then he paused and he said, well, boy, you're a child of, and then he paused, and he says, you're a child of God. I see the resemblance. I see a striking resemblance. Then he swatted me on the bottom and said, now you go and claim your inheritance. This man said, I left that church a different person. And now, in fact, that was the beginning of my life. So Dr. Craddock asked his name, and he said, my name was Ben Hooper. My name is Ben Hooper. And Fred Craddock remembered his father talking about Ben Hooper, who had been elected twice as the governor of his state. You see, Ben remembered who he was. He remembered his baptism. And so today, I moved the baptismal font here, and I wanted to say these words again like I did last year. That as Martin Luther would put his hand on his forehead and he would remind himself who he was, I'm a child of God. And so we know that we are buried in these waters with Christ and we are raised to new life with him. That the mercies of God are from everlasting to everlasting. And so today I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This is the good news of the gospel. And it is for you and for all. So whatever you've done, whatever you have failed to do, whoever you are, or whoever you wish you were, but are not, you are accepted, you are welcomed, you are washed clean, you are raised up, you are forgiven, and you are free. In the love of Jesus Christ, you are loved forever. In the waters of baptism, you are set free. You are set free to let go of the old, and broken to live a new life in resurrection and to follow together a joyful way a pleasure filled way after Jesus Christ our loving Savior so brothers and sisters in Christ remember you have been baptized and rejoice and if you've never been baptized, then find a church. Claim your inheritance. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your mercies are new every day. We thank you for calling us and claiming us. Calling us by name. Claiming us in the waters of baptism. 
and giving us such an incredible inheritance. So today, we remember our baptism. We remember who you are and who we are, your beloved children. In Jesus' name we pray. Today well, is a good day for us to confess our faith. So let's please stand and let's recite the Apostles' Creed. It's also found in the back of the
in the love of God, knowing he has called you, claimed you, and given you his Holy Spirit. Live in your inheritance. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.